So let's go ahead and get started here this morning. I have a Bible study here that I think is going to be pretty in-depth for those of you that have not heard this information or you're not familiar with what I'm going to be going over this morning, uh, you are in for a treat. <laughs> this is really interesting information. And the thing that I want to point out is this Bible that you have in your lap. I hope you have a Bible there in your lap and ready to go. It, it, sometimes we take this book for granted and we forget that this book is a very ancient, ancient document. And it's been translated into our language, and it seems like it's something, you know, you buy at stores all the time. But this thing is older than the Epic of Gilgamesh, some of the, some of the books in this Bible. And this is an extremely old book. This is uh, just as old or, or older than the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Okay, so this is an extremely ancient book translated in our modern English language that we're going to be going over this morning. And... The book of Revelation was written around 90 to 95 AD, okay? So that's over 1900 years ago. And the things that we're going to be looking at this morning is going to be the stuff that you've been seeing on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and all the major news networks in the last year. So the prophecies that this book wrote about are coming to pass, and we don't need to try to stretch anything. You'll see for yourself that this Bible predicted the things that are going on in our society right now and where this world is heading. And, it, and it's not hard to see that, yeah, it, it, everything that this book says is coming to pass right before our eyes. So I think this is going to be an interesting Bible study. It's going to be uh, very exciting. And for those of you that uh, are, are familiar with this subject or you do know about some of this stuff that I'm going to be going over, um, I've got some new stuff for you this morning, some twists on some theories that we've looked at. I think uh, some of the older interpretations uh, of this particular passage that we'll be looking at. Uh, there's some things about it that don't quite fit. And I'm going to try to navigate that this morning and see if we can come up with a theory that works a little bit better. All right. So Revelation chapter 13, go ahead and get your Bibles ready and turn there. Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to go kind of fast on some of these things. I'm going to read through these scriptures. Hopefully you'll have time to turn there. If you don't, you can always go back and watch this again. If I take too much time, this is a big Bible study, and I don't want to have this thing drag out for too long. So I'm going to try to go fairly quickly. So like I said, I figured I would do something kind of out of the ordinary uh, since we are all cooped up during this out of the ordinary coronavirus pandemic. And uh, let me just start this whole thing off by reading a few notable news items that have come out in the last couple of months to kind of set the stage for what we're going to be looking at this morning. This is from the magazine Futurism, and it says Bill Gates and MIT for many years have been working on technology to track vaccination records via an invisible tattoo. Together, MIT and Bill Gates have created an ink that can be safely embedded in the skin alongside the vaccine itself, and it's only visible using a special smartphone camera app and filter. Futurism explains the invisible tattoo accompanying the vaccine is a pattern made up of minuscule quantum dots, tiny semiconducting crystals that reflect light that glow under infrared light. The pattern and vaccine gets delivered into the skin using high tech dissolvable microneedles made of a mixture of polymers and sugar. The journal Science Translational Medicine explains the technology as a covert way to embed the record of a vaccination directly in a patient's skin rather than documenting it electronically or on paper. MIT researcher Kevin McHugh, who has worked on the project, said, quote, in areas where paper vaccination cards are often lost or do not exist at all, and electronic databases are unheard of, this technology could enable the rapid and anonymous detection of patient vaccination history to ensure that every child is vaccinated. As for Gates' involvement in the program, he wasn't just funding it as Scientific American reports, but, quote, the project came about following a direct request from Microsoft founder Bill Gates himself. Oh, how nice. Every child on the planet to get a vaccination. How nice. 
The direction the world is headed in is to vaccinate every human on Earth with a bio tattoo that would serve multiple purposes. It would provide diagnostics of your bodily health in real time, thanks to 5G. It would inoculate you from deadly diseases, supposedly. It would track every citizen so that no infected people could go into, into public places and put other people at risk. Uh, here's another article. John Rappaport, a journalist from InfoWars, compiled the following information in his article entitled, entitled Passport into the Brave New World, the Vaccine. Quote, a digital vaccine certificate would be used to signify immunity for all those who take the shot. It would function as a license, your passport into the brave new world. You know, you're immune, so you're allowed to move out of fear mode and circulate and travel and enter into schools. It would not protect you simply from the coronavirus, but would be pushed as a DNA vaccine that could help protect you possibly from all viruses. DNA vaccines have been openly discussed in the New York Times in an article entitled Protection Without a Vaccine, March 15th of 2015. The article is about, quote, synthetic genes used to, quote, protect against disease while changing the genetic makeup of humans. Now, this is not science fiction. This is a quote from the magazine. By delivering synthetic genes into the muscles of the experimental monkeys, the scientists are essentially re-engineering the animals to resist disease. That was reported in the New York Times. They go on to say, the sky's the limit, said Michael Farzan, an immuno and immunologist at Scripps and lead author of the new study. The first human trial based on this strategy called immunoprophylaxis, immunoprophylaxis by gene transfer, or IGT, is underway and several new ones are planned. Now remember, that was five years ago. IGT, immunoprophylaxis by gene transfer, is altogether different from traditional vaccination. It is instead a form of gene therapy. Now this is what the scientist is saying. Scientists isolate the genes that produce powerful antibodies against certain diseases and then synthesize artificial versions. The genes are placed into viruses and injected into human tissue, usually muscle. And here's the punchline. The viruses, quote, invade human cells with their DNA payloads, and the synthetic gene is incorporated into the recipient's own DNA. If all goes well, the new genes instruct the cells to begin manufacturing powerful antibodies. In other words, they, re they were saying they're re-engineering the DNA of the monkeys, and then once it's approved for human use, they're going to re-engineer human DNA. That's not what I'm saying. That's what Michael Farzan of the immunologist at Scripps and the lead author of this new study of immuno immunoprophylaxis by gene therapy. That's what he said. All right. And I don't know if you saw this recently, but in a recent Fox News interview conversation between Laura Ingram and Attorney General William Barr talking about the coronavirus and the vaccine, um, Laura Ingram says this, and, and Fauci and, and Burks are uh, recommending a vaccine to protect people from COVID-19. She says this, Bill Gates, the Gates, that, uh, the Gates Foundation are in favor of developing digital certificates that would, certain, that would certify that individuals, American citizens, have an immunity to this virus and potentially other viruses going forward to then facilitate travel and work and so forth. What are your thoughts from a civil libert libertarian point of view about these types of what, what some would say tracking mechanisms that would be adopted going forward to reopen our broader economy. And William Barr, the Attorney General, said this, yeah, I'm very concerned about the slippery slope in terms of continuing encroachments on personal liberty. I do think during the emergency, appropriate, reasonable steps are fine. Laura Ingram then quotes Bill Gates in a Reddit Ask Me Anything forum. She says he said this, but a digital certificate to show who has recovered or been tested recently or when we have a vaccine who has a database of people who've received it. All right, that's what Bill Gates was saying. Uh, and William Barr reacts, his reaction to Bill Gates' statement is this. Yeah, I'd be a little concerned about that, 
the tracking of people and so forth generally, especially going forward over a long period of time. So that's very interesting. A vaccine that would be electronic and track you and keep you safe, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the last days of the church age and Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Now, I realize that Christians have been saying that for over for about 2,000 years now. Everybody thinks that Jesus Christ is coming back in their day and age. And everybody thinks that, you know, even 500 years ago, people were thinking, oh, it's the end of the world. And so all those people have obviously been mistaken. So it's natural to ask the question, what makes you think that you're right and that we're in the end times now? I mean, how do you know that there isn't another 1,000 years to go before the rapture? You know, and that's a good question. I mean, that's a legitimate question. And I hope the Bible study today will answer that question for you. So look at Revelation chapter 13. And in verse 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, that'd be Satan, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. All right, so we're dealing with uh, Satan, and we're dealing with the Antichrist, and we're dealing with this coming one world government kingdom that's prophesied. And the first thing I want to point out is that this thing here in Revelation 13 is a Bible vision. Now, perhaps in the spiritual realm, in the fourth dimension, there is a John is seeing a literal beast emerge from a literal sea. I don't know. But when it comes to these Bible visions, the various elements of the vision are given for a reason, and they're symbolic and they're allegorical of, of something. That is to say, this verse is not saying that sometime in the near future, this gigantic seven-headed monster is going to come out of the ocean, you know, and the nations of the world are going to be all afraid and have to shoot it with their guns, and, you know, Godzilla is going to have to come and fight it. That, that's not what the Bible is talking about here. Okay, we're dealing with an allegory. We're dealing with a vision, a parable of things to come. And each notable aspect of the vision is representative of something. And also in these visions, bear in mind that one thing can often represent more than one thing. Okay, it can re represent multiple things. For example, the beast here that it's being described represents a man. It represents the coming Antichrist. But this beast is also the Leviathan that the Bible talks about and represents and represents Satan's various political global dominating kingdoms throughout the ages. The beast is the Antichrist, the coming one world ruler, yes, but the beast here also has seven heads which represent seven major global empires throughout history. Look at Revelation chapter 17 and look at the interpretation that the Bible gives in Revelation 17 verse 3. It says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, so that's the same monster from chapter 13. And here's the interpretation. Look at verse 9 of Revelation 17, verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Okay? on which the woman sitteth. All right, so now we need to ask ourselves this question. Are these seven mountains in the vision, are they literal, actual mountains somewhere on earth? Or is there another allegory here? Because we know from other places in the scripture, in the scripture that a mountain can be representative of a kingdom. We know that from Daniel chapter 2, and if you remember the Bible study that I did on moving mountains through prayer, uh, a mountain in the Bible can represent a kingdom, okay? So that is legitimate in the Bible. Now, obviously, a mountain can be a physical mountain, too. But uh, notice the interjectory statement by the Holy Spirit when he says he, in verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Okay, so he's going along talking, and then he pauses, and he says, here's the mind that hath wisdom, and then he gives you an interpretation. And whenever the Lord does that, you always want to pay attention when the Lord sticks in an interjectory statement. He does that over in Matthew chapter 24, when he's talking about the end times, and he talks about the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. And the Holy Spirit pauses and says, whoso readeth, let him understand. You always want to watch out when the Lord just kind of 
throws on the brakes and says, hey, pay attention to this. There's something important going on here that you need to really dig into and pay attention to. And I think there's something like that going on here in verse 9. I think what we have here is, if you will, a layered allegory. The seven heads and the, on these seven mountains, these seven heads mountains, they are literal. And when John wrote this, the scarlet woman harlot here, Mystery Babylon, was a city and was still sitting on seven literal mountains. And those seven literal mountains are Avatine Mountain, Kalian Mountain, Esquiline, Quirinal, Viminal, Capitoline, and Palatine. They are the seven hills of Rome. All right, so you have the Scarlet Woman. When John's writing this, she is sitting on seven mountains. And those are literal mountains in Rome today. They're called the seven hills of Rome. All right? But don't get so fixated on those literal mountains that you miss the additional wisdom found in the passage. The Seven Heads Mountains also represent seven Gentile kingdoms throughout world history, and you know that by the next verse. Look at verse 10. All right, so we have seven heads are seven mountains. Now, I got them drawn out as heads here, but these heads are also called mountains, okay? And then in verse 10, it says, and there are seven kings, okay? Kings are rulers of kingdoms, all right? And he says, uh, these, so, so these seven heads are seven mountains, and I believe these seven heads are not just seven literal mountains in Rome, okay? These seven heads represent seven kingdoms, and there are seven kings, okay? And in Revelation 13, 3, it says that one of those heads is going to be wounded to death, and then the deadly wound will be healed, and the whole world is going to be amazed, all right? So these seven heads have multiple representations. There's, there's layers to this allegory. The heads are, you know, the heads of Leviathan, spiritually. There's a, be, there's a creature in the universe, in the spiritual realm, that is Satan, called Leviathan, that literally has seven heads. It's a monster, okay? Then on top of that, so you have that interpretation. Then you have these seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, seven literal mountains in Rome. You could, you could have that. That would be a second interpretation. And then these seven heads represent seven kingdoms throughout world history. That's a third, a third allegory. And then a fourth layer to the allegory is these seven heads also represent seven kings. <laughs> Four layers to the allegory there. That's the word of God for you. All right? Now, when it comes to these seven heads, these seven mountains... You need to think outside of the parameters of just Rome, because there's more here than that. If you're thinking just Rome, just Vatican City, when you're reading Revelation 17, you're going to miss some stuff. And that's what I want to point out today a little bit. Revelation 17.10 says, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must, must continue a short space. Now this verse right here is a very important verse when it comes to identifying what the mountains are, okay? They can't just be the seven hills of Rome because those seven hills were in existence in Paul's or John's day when he was writing this and they're in existence today. How are you going to say that those seven mountains are just the seven mountains of Rome when he says five are fallen, one is and one isn't yet come? What is that supposed to mean? Five hills of Rome have fallen, one hill is left, and there's still one more mountain in Rome left to grow? No, that doesn't fit at all. So this, there has to be more to these seven heads, seven mountains, than just Vatican City, Rome, there by the Tiber River. Okay? Pay attention to that. All right? The first kingdom, then, going throughout history, when we're dealing with world global empires, the first one in history was Babel. And the king of that empire was Nimrod. And the Bible says in Genesis 10.10, 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. All right, Nimrod, historically speaking, from all historical counts, was a very wicked man. And historically, even our modern depictions of the devil, being this big, burly, you know, pitch black being with horns, that modern depiction of the devil comes from Nimrod. If you trace that thing back all the way back in history, that's what people remembered Nimrod as. It's, uh, it's interesting. But uh, 
he because he well uh, we did a whole nother study on that we'll get into that some other time but uh, the world's first empire was Babel where they were building the Tower of Babel you remember that in Genesis 11 and the world's first official global ruler was King Nimrod and so the other thing to keep in mind with these kingdoms okay while we're going through this is you want to remember that these kingdoms were possessed by a wicked female Re religious, murderous, idolatrous, covetous spirit described in Revelation chapter 17. All right? So this woman, she sits on seven mountains. Now, I believe that the Lord was trying to direct your attention to Rome for a reason, but that's not the only interpretation here. She has sat on every single one of these heads throughout history. She began in Babel with King Nimrod. So the woman is not just the Roman Catholic Church in Vatican City. She's a city that's linked with a spirit that's been on all seven mountains and not just Rome. The first mountain that this mystery Babylon spirit was uh, sat on was Babel. And that's where idolatry began as an official religion. Idolatry began in Babel as an official religion. It started at Babel with Nimrod, Semiramis, his wife, and Tammuz, his son, and spread out across the globe. And that's why ancient cultures that existed long before Jesus was ever born have religions that worship a mother and a son, and the son is someone who dies and rises again and is supposed to be the incarnation of the father. That's why you have that over in India, you have that in ancient cultures in China, you have that in ancient cultures all over the world. And that's why people say, oh, well, the story of Jesus and Mary and Joseph is not true. It's just a repeat of this ancient story that's been repeated since, you know, 4000 BC. No, Satan knew the prophecies since Genesis chapter 3, and he created a counterfeit of the true story that was going to happen when Jesus was born. That's why you have this Babylonian religion of worshiping this virgin mother all around the world, and she's holding this little baby, you know, and you're supposed to worship the little baby. The, the Jesus that the world worships is always either a little baby or a dead man on a cross. Why is that? Why do they never worship him as a ruling, strong, powerful, conquering king? Because that's not what the mystery Babylonian spirit wants. <laughs> it wants the woman in charge. But that's another study for another time. The second kingdom, after Babel was gone, was Egypt. All right, And this mystery Babylonian woman moved over to Egypt. That became the next global empire. You remember that in the Bible, Joseph helped bring that kingdom to a global domination, you know, when he was basically second in charge, the vice president, if you will, to Pharaoh. And the death of Pharaoh in the waters of the Red Sea is described as the breaking of one of Leviathan's heads in Psalms 74. Go and look at Psalms 74 quickly. And in Psalm 74 verse 13, I want to show you this. The Bible traces these seven heads throughout history. And, you, and remember, each one of these heads the woman sits on. Okay, so whether we can make the direct link in Scripture or not, if it's a head, you know that woman's sitting on it. All right, that murderous, religious, idolatrous, feminine spirit, right there. All right, Egypt, Psalm seventy-four, verse thirteen. It says, "Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength." What's that talking about? The Red Sea in in the Book of Exodus. Uh, Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. When did you read about that? I read about Moses and the children of Israel going through the Red Sea on dry land, and I read about Pharaoh coming in after him and the waters falling upon Pharaoh and killing Pharaoh and his army. But I never read about a, a Leviathan. Look at verse 14. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabit inhabiting the wilderness. <laughs> what are we talking about here? We're talking about the Red Sea crossing, and then we're talking about manna from heaven. What? And then there's a Leviathan with heads? There's something going on in the spiritual realm. God is describing the death of Pharaoh res was something going on in the spiritual realm with the destruction of one of these heads. Because Pharaoh... Looks like I'm having a few issues on YouTube for some reason. 
For those of you that are having trouble, uh, you can switch over to Facebook if you want, okay? So I don't know why you don't have a picture, but some people are saying that they don't have a picture here. All right, well, we gotta keep on going. So hopefully you can uh, hop on Facebook and watch it there. All right, so in the book of Exodus, obviously there was no physical dragon chasing the Jews back in the book of Exodus, but in the spiritual realm, God saw that Satan Leviathan as the power behind Pharaoh. And by destroying Pharaoh and the Egyptian army and, and annihilating the Egyptian empire, that was represent, representative of God knocking out this head. All right? Now, oh man, I'm getting disconnected all over the place. All right, now the third kingdom in history. Yeah, you guys are going to have to switch over to uh, Facebook. I don't know why the YouTube's not working. There's not really anything I can do about that at this point. It says it's live, so you'll have to switch to uh, Facebook. Switch to Facebook. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this, the third kingdom is Assyria, and the ruler of that kingdom was Sennacherib. And Assyria was a world power around 900 to 600 BC until it was defeated by the Babylonians in 609 BC. Okay. The capital of Assyria was the city of Nineveh. Okay. The capital of Assyria was the city of Nineveh. All right. When, when the Egyptian head got blown up, <laughs> that spirit had to move, and the next global empire was Assyria. She moves over to Assyria. And the capital of that city of, of Assyria was Nineveh, which was called in the book of Nahum. All right. So it sounds like you guys are having some uh, streaming issues. I'm guessing that it has to do with uh, probably your uh, connection, something like that. I'm showing that I have... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. You're going to have to tune in through Facebook in order to see it, I think, because everything's working on my end. So it might be something on your end. Not sure. All right. But thank you for the feedback. All right. So Assyria in the book of Nahum is called the bloody city. It's called the well-favored harlot. All right. Now think of Revelation chapter 17 and how well this matches. Revela uh, it's called the mistress of witchcrafts. Okay, witchcrafts, and she sells nations through her whoredoms and witchcrafts. All right, now that's describing the city of Nineveh in the book of Nahum. But that description of Nineveh matches what we read in Revelation 17. Why is that? Why does Nineveh sound like the city of Revelation 17? Because it's the same spirit. This is the new head. Sennacherib's the king, Assyria's the kingdom, this is the mountain, this is the head, and the woman sits on the mountain. Okay? All right, now the scarlet woman, she sits on the seven mountains, and she is identified and located as being in Assyria back in Nahum's day. All right, 700 BC. So the important thing to remember is that she hasn't stayed in one spot, you see. She is not a faithful woman like that. She doesn't stay in one spot. She moves around. You know, she works the streets. She's got a, she goes to a lot of different places, this harlot woman. And when the mountain gets blown out from underneath her, <laughs> she has to move to the next mountain. You understand how that works? All right. Look at uh, the, no the next one that the Mystery Babylon religion moves to. After Babylon, after Assyria is put down, is the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar overthrew the Assyrian Empire and Babylon became the new ruler of the world. All right? Now, the woman's name is Mystery Babylon, so there's an obvious, unmistakable connection with Babylon. She began in Babel, Babylon with Nimrod, and then a few empires later, she's back in the land of Shinar, and at Babylon. And in Jeremiah 51, 25, God calls the Babylonian Empire a destroying mountain. Jeremiah 51, 25, that God said he was going to cast down and make it a burnt mountain. All right? 
For those of you that are still having trouble uh, watching the video, go ahead and refresh your screens if you need to on YouTube or on Facebook, and hopefully you'll be able to get in. All right, now this is important. All right, so we've seen these four mountains in history, Babel with Nimrod, Egypt with Pharaoh, Assyria with Sennacherib, Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. All right, now we're going to get to number five, and we need to slow down a little bit. Because up until this point, the mountains and heads have been easy to identify, but we need to slow down. Now, Clarence Larkin, in, at least when he wrote the book Dispensational Truth that I have here on my shelf, he didn't know who these seven heads, these seven kings, these seven mountains were, at least according to his statement in Dispensational Truth on page 122. All right, So he didn't have this thing mapped out. He had a lot of stuff mapped out, but he didn't have these empires mapped out quite yet. Uh, Dr. Ruckman and David Hoffman, both of whom I have a lot of respect for, uh, they both make this fifth mountain. Okay, we're going to mountain number five. They make this fifth mountain the Persian kingdom under Darius. All right, so the Bible, the, the Bible believing. Uh, I hesitate to use the word scholars. That's not the right word. The, the people that uh, believe the Bible and, uh, and are done a great job teaching it, they make this fifth head, the Persian Empire, under Darius. Now, in my opinion, this is where the train leaves the tracks. Making the fifth head, the Persian kingdom, is going to... Ref is going to uh, yeah, okay, we're still having issues with YouTube. Making the fifth head, the Persian kingdom, is going to mess up our understanding of prophecy. All right. Now, this is a perfect example. When you're looking at the Bible and you're trying to figure out prophecy, and you, let's say it's like a puzzle. Prophecy is like a puzzle. If you get a piece in the wrong spot of the prophecy puzzle, sometimes it'll seem like it fits at the time. Okay, You get the piece put in and you think at the time, oh, this looks like it fits. You get it put in, but what happens? As you continue to build the puzzle, you find that other pieces don't fit with that piece. And you end up finding having all these pieces that don't go anywhere. Why? Well, the answer is because you have one piece put in the wrong spot. If you're ever going to finish the puzzle, and if you're ever going to be able to get the rest of the pieces put in where they're supposed to go, you have to remove the wrong piece or rearrange the wrong piece or take out the wrong piece and get the right one put in. And then what you find is, oh, all these other pieces start just fitting in perfectly. And I think that's what we have here. Making this fifth head the Persian kingdom is the wrong piece of the puzzle. And it's messing up some of the other, the rest of the of prophecies, making it to where we can't really get much farther on this particular subject because this one's messed up. All right? Looks like some of you have YouTube working just fine. So that means that your connection, wherever you are, is probably not very good. All right? So the problem is, uh, once you start rearranging pieces okay so I'm gonna rearrange some of the pieces of the prophecy puzzle but the problem is when you start doing that sometimes people get really mad at you and they say that you're proud or you're just dis being disrespectful <laughs> uh, whatever so normally it's taught that the fifth head is Persia and the sixth head is Greece and the seventh head is Rome that's how it's normally taught it's normally taught that the fifth head is Persia the sixth head is Greece, and the seventh head is Rome. All right? That's how it is in the Bible commentaries and in the uh, reference Bibles. I'm going to now dispute that claim and show you no why that cannot be true. Number one, the Persian Empire was a global empire, yes, but there, but there is not really any biblical record that indicates that it was a satanically inspired kingdom. Okay? Now, I realize that Satan is the king of this world and sets up the kings and the kingdoms and all that stuff. He has the authority to do that. But as I've taught you in the past, God is the king that rules in the heavens. His authority is higher than Satan, and God can override Satan's authority if he wants to. And that Persian Empire is a perfect example where God stepped in and overrode something that the devil would have wanted to do. Do you think the devil would rather have King Cyrus on the throne as opposed to Belshazzar? No, absolutely not. King Cyrus helped the Jews. He was an exception. He was, he was gracious to God's people. He helped the Jews go back to their land and rebuild their temple. 
The Persian kings were not exactly altar boys, okay, but they were dignified men who aided the Jews on multiple occasions. So the Persian Empire was one of those empires where God used his political authority to override Satan's authority. So this, this uh, fifth head here, it cannot be Persia. It's not a satanic head, okay? It's not satanic like that. Number two, there is no evidence that Mystery Babylon's spirit was anywhere in Persia. When you read about the record of Persia and the Persian kings, you don't read about this spirit that's in a murderous, idolatrous, fornicating uh, spirit. You don't read about that connected with Persia at all. And if this head was Persia, this woman would have to be sitting on it, and you would notice it. Number three, Cyrus was one of the four carpenters, I believe, in Zechariah's vision and helped the Jews as opposed to being one of the four horns who hurt the Jews. You remember that study I did on the four horns and the four carpenters. And number four, Rome cannot be the seventh head, as I'm going to prove in a moment. Okay, so if Persia is not the head of the Leviathan, not the fifth head, then we have to move on to the next global kingdom and see if it'll fit. The next global kingdom is the kingdom of Greece. After the Persian Empire, you have the Grecian Empire. Okay, I'm going to move her out of the way a little bit so you can see. Greece. Greece, you have Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes. So Greece does fit the overall description of these Leviathan heads in that Alexander was regarded to be the son of Zeus, and the legend was that Zeus had become a snake and slept with his mother and conceived Alexander. <laughs> That'll fit. All right. Uh, Alexander, he spared Jerusalem when he came through. But Antiochus later on, the king of the Grecian, one of the legs, the arms of the Grecian Empire, later on came in and massacred the Jewish pe people and defiled the temple by offering a pig on their altar. Okay, so that'll fit. The oracle at Delphi with all those priestess whores, seems to bear a lot of resemblance to that mystery Babylon spirit, right? For those of you that know about the oracle at Delphi in Greece, that'll fit, all right? So, now what we have here is each head of the Leviathan is representative of a, of a kingdom, primarily, and each kingdom has a notable king, but the head itself does not necessarily have to be a singular king, and I want to point that out. Meaning, what I'm trying to say here is that these heads primarily represent kingdoms, but there's the office of the king, and sometimes in these heads, multiple kings can hold that office. And I just want to point that out, because this office in, uh, in Greece can be held by Alexander, but then also Antiochus fits too. So I don't know if it has to be one or the other. It could be both. It's the office, okay? And that's important because in the case of Greece, there were many kings in that one head, that one kingdom. The kingdom of Greece was the head, but the kings spanned from Alexander the Great in 350 BC to Mark Antony and Cleopatra's defeat by the Romans in 31 BC. All right, so then if you make the fifth head Greece, Greece gets wiped out by Rome, all right? And you read about Cleopatra and Mark Antony, and Rome comes to power. And now the woman moves to that sixth head. Now, in my numbering, I have Rome as the sixth head mountain. And the reason why I think that is because of Revelation chapter 17. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I apologize that some of your guys' streaming isn't working. I do know that this is a subject that the devil is not interested in people knowing about. So maybe there's some connection there. <laughs> maybe our connection is being disrupted by the prince of the power of the air. Maybe. I would reckon to guess that there aren't a lot of Christian churches in this country that are going over this material this morning. So maybe there's a reason for it. I don't know. Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. It says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now when the apostle John wrote these words, it says that five kings had fallen, and the sixth was in power, in John's day, 
John was exiled to the island of Patmos around 90 AD by the Roman Emperor Domitian. He said, five are fallen. One, two, three, four, five. Five are fallen. One is. In John's day, the one that was in power was Rome. Okay? One is, and then he says, the other is not yet come. So Rome has to be the sixth. Again, the fifth head cannot be Persia, as the Bible commentators make it. It can't be. Rome has to be the sixth in order for Revelation 17.10 to be true. All right? All Bible commentators and expositors that I know of assume that Rome is the final empire, the empire of the Antichrist. It, Rome is certainly in the line of satanic empires, but, and it is certainly another mountain on which the woman sits, right? But Rome is not the end. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel has a vision of a giant stone image, and from the top down, each section of the image represents a different kingdom. You have the top head of gold, that's Babylon. Then you have the chest of silver, that's Persia. All right? And then it's important that in Daniel 2, he's giving you the order of the seven global empires, but those global empires do not have to necessarily match all of these heads. And I say that because you have Babylon at the top, and then the chest of silver is Persia. Persia is in that image in Daniel 2, but Persia is not one of these seven heads. That's important. All right, and then the next thing is you have the thighs of brass, okay? That's the Grecian Empire. And then you have the legs of Rome, all right? The legs of iron, I mean. And that represents the Roman Empire. And as each kingdom changes, the materials change, but the kingdom doesn't end with Rome, right? The, the feet are not of iron, the legs are of iron, and the legs are of Rome, but there's a change in the structure, the molecular structure of the feet, meaning that there's another kingdom that has to come after Rome. Okay? There are two more noteworthy things that come after the legs in Daniel chapter 2. You have the feet of iron and clay. That's the seventh kingdom. The feet are different from the legs. They're not made out of just iron. And that shows you that there has to be another kingdom after Rome. That is very important because nobody's putting that, no, nobody teaches that. And I'm pointing that out today because if you can get that, that's going to, that's the puzzle piece that needs to be removed and the right piece needs to be put in. So now you can start unlocking more of this Bible prophecy where the body of Christ has really been kind of in a traffic jam. There's a log jam and we haven't been able to really get any farther in prophecy for the last 25 years because of a few pieces put in the wrong place. Everybody makes Rome the final kingdom. It's not. There's another kingdom coming. All right. Rome is the sixth head. And according to Daniel's image, Rome is still in charge. The Roman Empire began with the pagan Caesars ruling. Okay. But the Roman Empire is still in charge today. It's still the global empire. Now it's been diminishing in its power, but the Caesars were called Pontifus Maximus. And now the popes have that same title, Pontifus Maximus. Pope Francis is Pontifus Maximus. Rome is still the ruling global kingdom except instead of ruling by brute force like they used to back under the pagan imperial Caesars in the early days of the popes when they'd go in with their armies and just overthrow nations, they don't rule by brute force anymore. The Roman Empire today rules by infiltration, subversion, coups, blackmail, and bribery. A lot of it through the Jesuits. The Roman Catholic global domination really took a beating by Martin Luther and William Tyndale and their work in publishing the Bible, first in German in 1545, and then in English in 1611 with the King James Bible. All right, And Rome has been in decline ever since. But as I've taught before, the third carpenter needs to finish off the Roman ruler, the Roman rule, before the fourth horn can come. The fourth horn is the Antichrist. But in those four horns, four carpenter study, you can't have the fourth horn, okay, the Antichrist, 
until the third carpenter wipes out the third horn. You have the third horn that's the Roman Empire, and then you have to have a third carpenter to knock out the Roman Empire to make way for the Antichrist's empire. All right? Another reason why I think Rome has to go. I think there will soon be a massive split in the Roman Catholic Church, which will result in a Catholic Reformation. Now, that's my opinion. I don't know if that's how it's going to work, but the Catholic, split is, Catholic Church has split once before, around 700 BC, uh, AD, and it went to the Eastern Orthodox and the West like that. So it split before, so it could split again. And the once great mountain of Rome will finally wither to nothing. And once again, the mystery Babylonian spirit will have to find another mountain. You see, a lot of the prophecy teachers get so fixated on the Roman Catholic Church there in Revelation 17 and 18 that they miss all of this other stuff, and they miss that this spirit, the Roman Catholic Church, whatever that spirit is that's behind that organization, is going to have to move one more time onto this seventh head. She's got to move one more time. The next mountain, the next kingdom, will be the seventh mountain. The seventh head mountain kingdom will be ruled by that man who is the beast, and that mystery Babylonian, Babylonian spirit will have to move to that mountain. All right, Revelation 17.10. Try to follow me if you can. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. Okay? There's one that's still to come. In John's day, Rome was in charge. There has not been another global empire since Rome. You say, well, what about America? Eh, Rome is still in charge. <laughs> Rome has been in charge of our presidents for a long time. Rome is the one that started our CIA. The CIA was started by the Jesuits. I don't know if you knew that. The deep states that you hear about on the news, that whole thing is Roman Catholic controlled. Did you know that a Roman Catholic, according to their religion, has to swear allegiance to the Pope? Their allegiance to their religion comes before their allegiance to their country. And so if you have a CIA run by Jesuits and Catholics and presidents who are Catholics, do you understand that according to the Roman Catholic doctrine, that president, JFK, let's say, John F. Kennedy, or any other Catholic president since then, is supposed to swear allegiance to the Vatican? Rome is still in control, believe me. All right? But Rome is going to be destroyed. Rome has got to be diminished. There's still got to be one more kingdom to come. The seventh king is the one that's coming. And he's the seventh head. It's the Antichrist. And so he has to be a king then. And that would explain why the white horse rider in Revelation 6 is wearing a crown. The white horse rider in Revelation 6 is the Antichrist, and he's wearing a crown on his head. Why? Because he's a king. He's a king over the seventh kingdom. Now you say, well, are we looking for an Antichrist who's a leader of a political kingdom? Not necessarily. It looks to me that that white horse rides after John is taken into heaven. And then the seal is opened, and he sees the white horse rider with a crown. The Bible, I, we're going to recognize the man of sin, but I don't think he's going to be a king while the church is here. I think he's going to be elected to political authority after we're raptured. We'll rec he might be a man in politics, but he's not going to be a king until after the rapture, more than likely. And that implies that the man of sin does not rule over his seventh kingdom until after the rapture. Okay? So, once, so the rapture is going to happen, and then... Here comes the white horse rider. Now he's got a crown. And now he's got his seventh kingdom. The seventh head really doesn't rise to power until after the rapture, it looks like to me. If I was going to draw an arrow as to where I think the rapture is going to be, I think it would be between the sixth and seventh head. The church goes out after the sixth head. I don't think we're going to see that seventh head. I don't think the man of sin is going to be a king while we're here. All right, verse 11. And the beast that was... And is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Turn to Revelation 13 and look what happens to this seventh head. Revelation 13, verse 3, the seventh head is the Antichrist. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, 
and all the world wondered after the beast. So Satan counterfeits everything that God does. And undoubtedly, the Antichrist is going to counterfeit the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is actually going to rise from the dead. By all indications, it looks like he's going to be assassinated and rise from the dead, but his resurrection is going to be by the power of Satan. The seventh head would die, rise from the dead, and then become the eighth head. So the Bible talks about seven heads, and then it talks about this eighth head of the dragon. But the eighth is the seventh. The seventh gets killed, knocked out, and then rises from the dead. And so you have still seven heads, but the seventh head is also the eighth head. Okay. Now, hopefully you're able to follow along with me on this. I know it's a lot of information. <coughs> But like I said, we could go on for three hours with this stuff and try to break it all down detail by detail, but we've got to get through it. All right? Pay attention that the woman, she sits on the seven mountains. She doesn't sit on the eighth mountain. She doesn't sit on the eighth head. You say, why? Because she's destroyed after the seventh head. Look at uh, Revelation 17:12. This seventh head is interesting. This seventh head, this coming kingdom, is going to have ten horns on it. Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So it says they are kings which have received no kingdom as of yet. Now I've got uh, ten horns here on this last head, this seventh head. Those are, those are ten kings, the Bible says. But they're kings without kingdoms. Now that's weird. Here's a riddle for you. How can these be ten, how can these be ten individuals? Sorry, let me re rephrase this. How can these ten individuals be kings without kingdoms? How can these ten individuals be kings without kingdoms? It says they are, they are kings, but have received no kingdom as of yet. So they're kings without kingdoms. That seems backwards. You have, to be, you have to have a kingdom to be a king, right? So how are these people kings without kingdoms? Chew on that for just a minute. Think about that. That's an interesting Bible riddle. The ten kings correspond with the ten toes on Daniel's image there in Daniel chapter 2. I'll read for you Daniel chapter 2 verse 41. Now this is all very important future prophecy. And we're seeing it fulfilled right before our eyes. This seventh head, the seventh kingdom is coming soon and there's ten kings associated with it and we are in the very, we're in like the ankles of the Rome of the uh, iron legs. Okay. So we're at the very end. We're about to get to the feet, the seventh kingdom there. All right. And we're at the very, we're in the ankles. We're at the end of those iron legs, the Roman empire, the things about to fall. All right. Uh, Daniel two forty one, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, 10 toes, 10 Kings, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings, speaking of the ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. So that's when the Lord comes back and destroys the kingdom of the Antichrist and these ten kings, and Jesus Christ takes over. Now, whoever these ten kings are, the Bible says that they mingle themselves with the seed, the children of men which has a very ominous and very disturbing implication. If they are mingling themselves with the seed of men, which would be humans, it, it means that these ten are not human. You say, what are you saying, Brother Crane? I'm just affirming what Jesus said. 
Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you remember what was odd about the days of Noah, according to Genesis chapter 6? In the days of Noah, in Genesis chapter 6, you had fallen angels producing offspring with human women. It was iron mixed with clay. You know how these ten individuals can be kings without kingdoms? These ten individuals that are to come, they're kings without kingdoms? The only solution to that riddle that I know of is if they are ten rulers in the spiritual realm. That would make them kings without necessarily a kingdom. They're rulers in the spiritual realm. Paul spoke about principalities and powers. He spoke about the rulers of the darkness of this world being spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul said that Satan was the prince, the prince, as in the ruler, the king, the prince of the power of the air. The angel that spoke to Daniel said that he was hindered 21 days by the prince of Persia. That has to be an evil demonic ruler in the spiritual realm. You say, do you really believe that, Brother Crane? Absolutely. That's what the Bible says. There are rulers in the spiritual realm. And it looks like these, there are ten of them, and they're going to come down and be kings on the earth. They're going to be given physical kingdoms for one hour with the beast. These ten individuals are spiritual kings in the heavens who get cast down, it looks like. I read in Revelation 12 that there's going to be a war in heaven, and that Satan and his angels will be cast down to the earth. And this casting down corresponds with the start of the Great Tribulation period, that final three and a half years. The fall of Satan, correspond, the fall of Satan from the heavens to the earth corresponds with the Antichrist rising from the dead. And I suspect that those ten kings will be ten fallen angels and will be part of that fall. That is to say, the Satan as the Antichrist, Satan is, is the Antichrist risen from the dead here. The Antichrist is a man possessed with the spirit of Satan, just like he, he basically is Satan manifest in the flesh at this point. And with him are ten kings that come down. The ten kings, I believe, show up right here. Now, we've been raptured long out before then, but the ten kings come down and they show up right there. Now, think about that. Think about what's going to be happening in the world at that time. You have a man who was assassinated three days prior, and he just rose from the dead. And simultaneously, you have these ten glorious beings making their appearance on the earth. I mean, I mean imagine that. <laughs> Can you imagine how how can you imagine this incredible event unfolding? I mean, how how will the people of the world react when they see these 10 kings on the earth who aren't human? They're fallen angels. I mean, movies have been trying to portray this epic event for the last 100 years. I mean, this will be the full disclosure event that UFO investigators have been waiting for, right? This will be the return of the ancient aliens that the History Channel and the cable networks have been conditioning the world for for the last 10 years. Bear in mind but that by the time these 10 kings show up, the world will have been experiencing the beginning of sorrows. By the time these 10 kings show up, the world will have experienced earthquakes, famines, pestilences in diverse places, plagues, COVID-19, new bioweapons, all kinds of other uh, plagues after the rapture of the church. The world will experience all kinds of chaos and carnage. The Bible talks about World War III, the red horse riding through there. The Bible talks about wars and rumors of wars and nations fighting against each other. The Bible talks about in this time period, there's going to be great persecution of the 144,000 and anybody who professes faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about during this time, there's going to be a global famine and massive portions of the earth's population is going to be destroyed. Millions and even billions of people dying during this first seven years of the beginning of sorrows after the rapture of the church. The world's going to be in a mess. And then these ten kings seem to show up out of nowhere. They look like us, only a little bit bigger and greater in power and might. They call themselves the Watchers. 
because they claim that they've been watching us for thousands of years. They tried to tell us, back in the 70s and 80s especially, that we were destroying the planet, that there needed to be national nuclear disarmament, and that we needed to protect the environment. But no one listened, except Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She listened. <laughs> and now, these ancient aliens, these gods, have come down to save us from ourselves. How wonderful. Now remember, since the man of sin was a king at this time of the seventh mountain, when he rises from the dead, he's still a king in, in, of that one kingdom. Okay? Keep that in mind. But Revelation 13 shows that he's going to be given all the kingdoms of the world. And look who gives those kingdoms to him. Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power, their power and strength unto the beast. Now we know that the beast is going to wind up with all the kingdoms of the world. But in order for these ten kings to give all the kingdoms of the world to the Antichrist, they must have had all the kingdoms of the world first, right? I mean, they can't give the kingdoms of the world to the Antichrist if they don't have it themselves. So think about this. Putting two and two together, it looks like mankind is deceived. Maybe the strong delusion that the Bible talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2. Mankind is deceived into thinking that these ten beings are the ascended masters that their ancient forefathers worshipped. And so all 180 plus nations of the world yield their sovereignty to these ten kings. They realize that humanity has been terrible stewards of this planet. And they realize that the only way to end man's inhumanity to man is by giving it to the ones who claim to have created us. They're the ones who seeded planet Earth eons ago, right? Where does the movies get all this information? Where, where do the movies get this stuff from? They get it from a King James Bible. They just they don't even know it. These spiritual kings receive power as physical kings on the earth for one hour. And you know what they do with their one hour? According to the Bible in Revelation 17, they, destroy, they, they decide to destroy a Babylonian harlot in one hour. They attack a city that is the headquarters of the one world religion. They burn it to the ground. The seventh head, the woman sitting on the seventh head. You say, well, if the seventh kingdom is not Rome, what is that seventh kingdom? That's another study for another time. <laughs> but this final seventh kingdom that comes into power after the rapture, this woman is sitting on that head. And when these ten kings show up, they burn her to the ground. And she's gone. Why did they burn the woman? Why did they destroy the woman? Why did they destroy that mystery Babylonian religious idolatrous harlot? Well... The answer is simple. Haven't you heard? Religion causes wars. Isn't that what you've heard your whole life? Isn't that what people say when you try to witness to them? Religion causes wars. All right? Isn't that what Karl Marx and many of the communist philosophers have said all along? <laughs> no more religion. There's no need for religion anyway. The gods are here. The gods have, have descended, the ten kings. Religion worships the idols that represent those gods, and now that they're here, there's no more need for religion. And they destroy the Roman Catholic Babylonian woman. All right, They eliminate religion. Revelation 17, verse 16. We're wrapping up here. Don't you worry. It says, "...in the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore." and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The mystery Babylonian spirit is gone. The eighth mountain 
is now here, and she doesn't sit on that eighth mountain. She sat on the seventh. The seventh head was assassinated and then raised from the dead, and then those ten kings come and knock that woman off, and that eighth head is in rule, is, is in charge and in authority, and there's no mystery Babylonian, Babylonian spirit anymore. Now let me finish with a scenario that's an attempt to put a bunch of these pieces together and try to reconstruct this whole thing. After that one hour where they destroy Mystery Babylon, that city, and they burn it to the ground, and there's no more pretense of religion on the earth, these kings announce to the world that they will not rule over man. They claim that if they wanted to rule us, they could have done so at any time in our feeble history. Their desire is to help mankind along our evolutionary path. And now at last, one person among the human species has made the next leap in evolution. One man has evolved to the point of being immune to death and decay. The human species is now at the threshold of its destiny, and they yield their global dominion back to humanity to be ruled by the evolved man the Neo-Sapien. In Revelation 13, verse 3, it says, And all the world wondered after the beast. Verse 4, And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Three and a half years. And you know what happens next? You know what happens next. A mandatory mark is required to be installed in the hand or the forehead of every person on earth. And everyone's personal identification and banking information is stored in that mark and there's no buying or selling without it. You can't buy gas with your, for your car without it. You can't travel on an airplane without it. There's no travel without it. You can't pay your cell phone bill without that mark. There's no communication without it. Uh, everyone will be required to get the mark, and this mark is directly connected with allegiance to the Antichrist. Spiritually speaking, anyone who receives the mark of the beast is damned, according to Revelation 14. Now, real quick, just remember, if you're born again, if you're saved right now, you don't have to worry about any of that. You will not be here for the mark of the beast. You're going to be raptured out. You're going to be taken away first, and the world left behind is going to have to deal with that. You will not be here for the mark of the beast. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. All right? But just as you uh, think about this, anybody that receives the mark of the beast is damned, according to Revelation 14. Uh, spiritually, eternally damned. There's no forgiveness for it. Just as you received eternal life when you received Jesus Christ, those people will, will receive eternal death when they receive the Antichrist. It'll be spiritual death. They'll be receive the second death when they get the mark in their forehead or in their hand. They won't know that, though, when they take it. That wouldn't be a very effective sales pitch. <laughs> All right, you get this, you're going to have eternal death. Okay, go ahead and sign up and stand in line. No, it's going to be a deception. The world's going to be deceived and given to strong delusion. If you ask, in, in my opinion, I think they might... They might have the, the opinion that they're getting eternal life by taking the mark. Just like the, the Antichrist has eternal life. He's raised from the dead, never to die again. And if I take the mark of the beast, I'll be like him. I'll have eternal life. Right? You know, my eternal life in Jesus Christ is connected with the blood of Christ, right? And your eternal life is connected with the blood of Christ? Absolutely. So I wonder seeing as how the Antichrist and Satan counterfeits everything God does, I wonder if the mark of the beast will be connected with the blood of the Antichrist. I mean, surely this evolved man must have special DNA. He must have special genes and special antibodies running through him, right? Special antibodies that give him immunity from death. Now, how would you get his antibodies into you? How would you get his special blood into you? Well, maybe the mark of the beast will involve a vaccine. 
Side effects may involve itching, swelling, redness, a burning sensation, and a bright white spot. Leviticus 13. But don't worry, that's normal. You know, vaccines don't cause autism, and vaccines certainly won't cause leprosy. <laughs> Allow me to end with this headline from biometricupdate.com, September 20th, 2019. Headline, ID2020 and partners launch a program to provide digital ID with vaccines. The ID2020 Alliance has launched a new digital identity program at its annual summit in New York in collaboration with the government of Bangladesh, Vaccine Alliance Gavi, Gavi and new partners in government, academia, and humanitarian relief. The program to leverage immuniz immunization as an opportunity to establish digital identity was unveiled by ID2020 in partnership with the Bangladesh government's Access to Information Program, the Directorate General of Health Services, and GAVI, G -A -V -I, according to the announcement. Digital identity is a computerized record of who a person is stored in a registry. It is used in this case to keep track of those who have received a vaccination. The City of Austin, ID2020, and several, several other partners are working together with homeless people and the service providers who engage with them to develop a blockchain-enabled, that's cryptocurrency, blockchain-enabled digital identity platform called MyPass to empower homeless people with their own identity data. Does anybody remember hearing about this pilot program in Austin just a few months ago, back in October? I remember hearing about that in the news. It was considered a conspiracy theory back when it was going on, but homeless people in Austin, Texas were reporting that they were being invited to have microchips implanted into them that would help track them and keep them safe. That was ID 2020. The Digital Alliance. Provide digital ID with vaccines. So folks, we are at the end. We're at the end of this Bible study, but uh, we are also at the end of the church age. And like I said, this Bible, this is an ancient document that's been around for thousands of years, and it, on paper, it has had all of these things printed for the last 2,000 years since John wrote the book of Revelation. It's been there. And now we're watching it unfold right before us. This Bible is God's book. Now listen, if you're saved, you're not, looking, you're not waiting for uh, the mark of the beast and all that stuff. You're waiting for the sound of a trumpet, and you're waiting for a voice to say, come up hither. Now if you're not saved, if you never trusted Christ as your Savior, you are in big trouble. If you're saved but backslidden and you've been living like the devil, you better get right with God. Because here pretty soon, you're going to be face to face with Jesus Christ, and you are going to get a rebuke from the God who created you, the Savior who died for you, and it is not going to be fun for you at the judgment seat of Christ. You don't have to worry about going to hell, but the Bible talks about there's a suffering of loss and shame at the judgment seat of Christ. So if you're saved... But you're not living right, get right with God right now. You need to repent. Get, right, get things right while you still can. Now, if you're not saved, if you're still trusting in your baptism or your good works or your church membership or your religion or the fact that you're a good person, if you're trusting in your good works to get you to heaven, you are not saved. You are not born again. You are not a Christian. You need Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you better get saved today. Do not put it off anymore. Quit trusting your good works. Quit trusting your baptism. Quit trusting your church. Trust in Jesus Christ alone. He died on a cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead so that you could be saved. And the Bible says that salvation is a free gift that you receive by faith. Ask Jesus Christ to save you from hell and he will. Put your full trust in Jesus Christ. Not summon Jesus and summon your good works. Okay? Not my baptism plus Jesus, or my, my church plus Jesus. No, it's just Jesus Christ. Put your trust in Jesus alone. Get on your knees, admit to God you're, that you're a sinner, 
Tell God that you believe that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead, and that you're putting your full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Ask Him to save you today, and He will. Ask God to save you from hell, and He will. Salvation's a free gift, but if you miss it, or if you decline, or if you just put it off, and you miss your chance for salvation, you are going to regret that forever. And listen, like I said, we are at the end. Today may be your last chance. You don't have any guarantee of what's going to happen tomorrow. You might die of the coronavirus. You say, oh, I'm not worried about that. You might die from a car, a car wreck. You might die of a heart attack. You might go to sleep tonight and you might not wake up. Or you'll wake up in hell. You better get saved while you still have time. Today may be your last chance. You know what to do. Put your faith in Christ. Get on your knees. Trust Jesus Christ today. Do it. I hope this Bible study has been a blessing to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned some things. And I hope I've given you some new things to think about. And God bless you.